start. We'll try to do it in 45 minutes and get everybody to bars. He was so far. Oh, oh. All right. Well, the first thing that I called, first thing I one actually Oh, I'm about to walk over to now, some of the idiots. So that's the thing he's scheduling, and she's going to look and walk and walk away. Good. Oh, okay, away. cool. So let's just get started. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. In the back, can you all see me? Speak up. Speak up. Like, by what? I can't hear you. Just turn around and show the audience. Okay, this is not really about us, but just for a little credibility, we've been doing this since 2004. Michael Edson was our second client with the William Bateman acquisition. Hey, that was a great project. Oh, I'm happy to talk about it in 47 minutes. <laughs> then thank you for coming. Uh, we work with about 4,000 cultural organizations, so we, since it's cloud-based, we really know what we're going to do. So the things that I'm going to talk about today are the things that we can tell you what's going to work and what's not going to work to save you a lot of heartache and headache. And we work with probably 10 OK. So we do a well, website, and app, and text messaging, and audio, and fundraising. And today, three topics. What, what are we seeing in mobile at a high level? And what are we seeing with visitation trends? And some examples. We'll talk a little bit about big picture, but this is more of what could I implement today, or what am I thinking about implementing today that may or may not be a very good idea. Because just because it's mobile or technology doesn't mean anybody's going to use it, as we all know. OK, so what does mobile mean? I remember having a conversation with Michael about this on coffee shop five years ago. Is mobile a StarTac phone or a laptop? Or is it um, my laptop that I take with me on the road, or is it some wearable device? So that's a big issue for a lot of people. Is what am I trying to connect to? And if you talk to people that are in the wearable technology world, or the Google Glass world, like what Mark was showing yesterday, now they would say that's the future of mobile. So mobile is kind of expanding. But anything that's really connected to the internet is what we're going to be looking at. OK, so these trends, let's talk about these trends. So uh, almost three-fourths of people that come in here and have a smartphone, which means they can connect to the internet. They're probably pretty used to connecting to the internet. And if you look at a family unit, this is more like 85%. So most people that are coming into your institutions are able to connect to the internet. Uh, the bond between you and your phone is growing much deeper than it used to be. And the implication there is there are some great ways to reach out and touch these visitors, but because it's more and more personal, you cannot abuse them. It used to be in the past, if you send them an extra text or something, that's okay. Now, because it's such a personal thing, it's not okay. Um, I read a study in the Pew Research that what percent of people take their smartphone with them in the bathroom? Have done that as a regular person of business. Yeah. Their smartphone, that have a smartphone that is in the bathroom. Where, where are you going to leave it? Seventy-five percent take it with them in the bathroom. So this is really a game changer in terms of this device, which used to be just used for one or two things. I used to use it for texting. I used to use it for whatever. Now it's something that, as you know, you don't walk out the door without your phone. So location-based is coming. It's kind of the holy grail in museums and cultural institutions, if not ready yet. And most of the examples that I've seen, except once, maybe at the Museum of Art and a few others, have, have failed because it's just not. It's too hard. It's not working. And people are very unforgiving with technology. So if I use something and it doesn't work fast, I'm not going to use it again. So there's not that much forgiveness. So when you do something with technology, especially mobile, it's got to just work. You've got to just nail it the first time. It can't be something that's like download, click do this, turn on Wi-Fi, blah, blah, blah. That's not going to work. People are going to be very uh, discerning about abandoning it. Abandoning. So personalization, if you really want to do something that's going to excite people, let's say for Chinese visitors, a tour of exhibits that 
this museum with a Chinese influence, people will love it. Having my phone registered in your system, and I know that you're a family, that I know that you're a team, and that means that when I scan something on a QR code, or I dial a number, or I look at a mobile website, I'm looking at different content. That's, of course, very popular now with retailers, or with merchandisers, and that is eventually going to move itself into the cultural institution. And visitors are going to respect that because when they go to, it, it, as you probably have seen, when you go surf the web, if you're on Amazon and you're looking at uh, lawn furniture, and you're two days later looking at another site, you'll see lawn furniture advertisements. Did you all notice that? Did you ever notice that? Now, now you'll start noticing it. I can't get away from the NH photo ads <laughs> anymore. And, and, it, and it's the ad for what I looked at that I want to purchase, the current pricing over and over. Exactly. And so um, CBS uh, Sunday morning did a really interesting uh, bit. I mean, when you come to certain websites, Yahoo's or Google's website, how many different companies are grabbing information about you and putting it all together? So that if you filled out your name on one page over here and you're still logged in and your IP address is being tracked, all that is being calculated. So the next time you come on, all of this information is available to advertisers to make it a better experience. Well, that same thing will be happening in mobile, where a person could, uh, we, can, we can start to know your phone and know what you like and develop content that relates to that. Hello. Welcome. OK. Um, security and privacy, the whole target thing, the big issue. Uh, over the holidays. It's not huge yet, but it's going to be more and more popular as a concern as people's phones don't get hacked and there are more issues with information being taken out. So this is not going to be a big issue in the next year or two, but then it will be. Wearables. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about what we saw yesterday with the glasses and kind of what you think how that might come into play in the world of museums? Well, from yesterday, I guess the main takeaway is that um, augmented reality has a lot of potential, but uh, for pricing reasons, for challenges of uh, recognition in our spaces and so forth, it still has a little way to go. But the potential is so fantastic that I can have something with me, either my iPad or Google Glass or something, and walk around and without having to use my phone to do something, I can just look at this. I'm watching a video. I'm seeing more content. It's all localized. It's personalized for me. That's where wearables will come into play in a very big way. Uh, how many of you have the Nike fuel bands or Fitbits? Any of you in the room? In uh, San Francisco, <laughs> it really has no. <laughs> it's just addicted to anything that comes out. Even in the so all of that is in the whole wearable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's coming. Or 
adding some data to something else. And um, where this is going to go in the cultural hello, where this is going to go in culture cultural center, I'm not I'm not sure, but I think it has to do can have to do with crowd control, it can have to do with the experience that you that you're seeing. So the Internet of Things is going to be a big a big deal. And then the last one is I just spoke at the um, Work Life Balance Conference, which my wife thought was pretty funny so I had to work on that. And it was all about how mobile is blending that. And I think that's probably in all a good thing that when if we have to do something during the day, go to our kids' soccer game, it's almost a trade-off because we're going to be checking our email on a Saturday. So this idea that I can work from home, I may have uh, other responsibilities during the day, I might want to check my Facebook, I might want to do personal things, but because I'm so connected, it's giving me a better sense that I'm missing out or that I'll still be able to connect with all my, you know, my work done. So this blending of work and social is another big trend that we're seeing. Questions so far? Okay, so what what are the trends that we are seeing? So bring your own device is something that we've been promoting all along since we started eight years ago, and I think that's what people want. There are certainly reasons why you might want to have some kind of a device on hand, but for the most part, people want to use their device. They're comfortable with it. That's what they want to do. This is a very important topic. It's got to be fun. Whatever you're going to do with mobile has to be fun and really easy. And the reward has got to be greater than the effort. And if you remember one thing from my little talk today, when you're thinking of designing something, that's it. If a QR code takes more than five seconds to get the information on your phone, People don't want to learn that much. Now that's a big generalization. But the average visitor to an average museum, 50% of the visitors, now this is of course, Smithsonian is an exception, but the rest of the world, 50% of visitors are there because their friend or their spouse brought them. So I think that's higher here. Yeah, higher. Yeah. Is every school group? Yeah, there you go. So half the audience is just walking around because Michael said I should go to the museum. Um, and if I want to engage, it's got to be so easy. I liken it to you're at a science museum and there's a big button and it says, how much does the Hubble telescope weigh? Press the button. I press the button and it lights up and I know the information. That's about as much work as people want to do. And if you want to take, make, make me take my phone out, and do something, it better be really, really easy. And what I'm getting from that has to be great. Game like, uh, people talk about gamification. I spoke at two conferences last year on gaming, one in Atlanta, one in Seattle. And my conclusion is game, game like type of interactions are fabulous, but if it turns too much into I've got to know the game, unless I'm here on a school trip or I'm really interested in that topic, it's too, it's too hard. If it's part of your big branding, and we'll talk about Colonial Williamsburg, then it will work, but you don't want to have complicated games. It's got to be something that's kind of fun, a trivia game, a contest. Texting, do something, dial a number, just something really easy, then you'll find that people will love it after you love it. Do you have a, so, so, what if I, so here's, because I know you so well, I'm going to call those for Do you have a kidney um, Well, we're going to do one in a second. Okay. And you'll see. That's my way you will go away. It's a good no, won't remember that question later. <laughs> Uh, short attention span, everybody is tremendously short attention span. Yep. Right. So exactly right. So does that mean that people are going to download an app to take a tour? I learned from uh, the William Wegman show eight years ago. I came to see how people were using it with a dial and phone number and press. And people were using it a lot. 
and I would go up to you after you had used this and say, how was your tour? And what do you think everybody told me? I don't take a tour. I don't really like tours. I think, oh my god, this is either really bad for my business or it's, it's good. Hello. Come on in. So, what I quickly learned is people do not want to take a tour. Now, I love Dawson tours. I got into this because I love the whole learning more about the museum. But the average person in an average museum, they don't want it. And they don't want a tour on their phone. So, so many museums I talk to are spending all this money on building these apps, these curatorial collections, and I'm going to have this phone and I walk around. And I'm going to go find number 22 and do this. I don't know any museum that's really finding that to be tremendously successful. And that's because of my belief that the average person doesn't want to do that. Well, you'll always get 5 or 10% to do it. Or if it's the Renoir collection and you pay 20 bucks to go to the Phillips collection, okay, can give me the tour and I'm going to squeeze every bit of juice out of that. That's a whole different story. But the average person walking into the average museum, they don't want to. Yeah? But we do know, is it safe to say that the average person walking into the museum does have in their pocket a cell phone connected to the internet? A smartphone connected to the internet? That's and right. Will, and will use it? They will really use it if the reward is, is greater than how hard it is to use it. Do we know anything about how often, how often an average visitor out of common visits, they will pull out their, pull out their, smart, their smartphones to look up something related to the subject of the museum. Not, not necessarily using a museum sanctioned app, but they'll use it, they'll look up the Wikipedia, they'll search, they'll pull out something. Do you know, have any data about no, that? No, that would be great to know. Yeah. Yeah. Comparing yeah. that to take up rates for uh, it's not very good apps would be. Right. right. I'll ask the web. That would be a great. Well, you're talking, ask the web. Okay. Um, short attention span goes also with contextual interactions. And I've got an example of every one of these in a second, and we'll all do it on your phone. Contextual means I'm walking around, Joe and I are walking around, and I see this, and I think, oh, I think my father was, you know, flew one of these things. The call to action, as we say in the drama world, has to be right here and has to be clever enough and convincing enough that it's worth me taking this device out of my pocket and doing something. So if you just have a little sign here that says, learn more, tax, dial, scan, not many people will do it. You've got to have a little marketing and a little teaser. Here from one of the pilots, the 85-year-old retired Captain Morgan, who flew in this plane, you'll have an unbelievable program. And I first learned this at the Phillips Collection. The Phillips Collection uh, was one of our earlier clients, and they would um, put teaser questions on all the wall labels. And their numbers were five times, ten times higher than any of our other clients. So I remember I went to them and said, what, what's going on? And they said, well, I don't know why. It's just that we're the Phillips Collection. And I walked around, and they had all these great questions. So my advice to all of you is, not only do you have to make it fun and easy and contextual right here, but you've got to make it clever with your, with your, uh, with your marketing. It's also kind of at odds with the fact that it sounds, seems that many curatorial staff don't even want you to put a number up there to get out the device to work, much less change the text to focus people on the exactly tour. Exactly right. And that's, that's the issue so many of our museum clients face. I remember doing some work with the career sector. And when you walked into a beautiful room, over in the corner was a rack with rack cards. And if you took a rack card out, there was a diagram of where you could find the commentary, which was fantastic commentary. What were you able to do? It's too hard. It's not contextual. But when you listen to the commentary about the base that came from the Ming Dynasty, it's worth billions of dollars. You say, oh my god, this is fantastic. But I'm not going to go back and, and get that. Those institutions, like in fact, I have a slide of the Air and Space in one of the galleries up here, they have great big labels 
which have teaser questions. And it's one of the most popular, even to this day, it's one of the most popular tools that we have out of all four of them. But yeah, it's at odds with what the museum has uh, problem like that. The other thing that we're finding is that if, you, if the departments will work together, not only will you have a two times, you'll, you'll have two to three times better impact on the results. And I'll show you an example in a second. And then slowly we're starting with the iPad being used for um, exhibit displays. We did a, uh, a project with sites. And so some of the museums that are spending a lot of money on these expensive touch panel things are starting to use iPads in little stands and go back up. Can you take a picture of this cost department? Up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Very artistic. Are you doing? Questions so far? Okay. So now we get to use our phones. Okay. So the so the first we had about eight bullets on that. The first one was bring your own device. So here is it's contextual. It's really simple. It's device independent, and you can hear Supreme Court judges on your phone. So everybody, take out your phone and dial that number and press one pound through eight pound. And you'll hear Senator Dale Conner, or some of the Supreme Court justices. And imagine you're standing in front of a portrait of them. If somebody wants to go speak with me, you can In my community, there were not that many people in, uh, in the wider profession that the world offers. Um, as a result, so the, the point there is she is not a great speaker. The quality wasn't fantastic. But if you ask visitors about that, because people can be press zero and leave comments, they would say, I can't believe I heard the report just so and so on my phone. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, and so this, because it was so easy, and it was, it was pretty cool to hear some people just on online phone, that met the reward uh, effort ratio. And it was right here. But this was something that I had to download, download the app, go to the mobile website and try to find it. It goes back to the two months. Okay, let's go through some more. Okay, so this is fine. This is a Hubble, a Hubble telescope. Why can I see right through this telescope? So these institutions that put a teaser question. In fact, yesterday when, when I was up in the gallery, I saw this group of kids. They all had their red uh, grade school t-shirts on. And they were reading all these questions. And one of them would take their phone up, and they would put it on a thing. And they go, oh, that's really cool. I've heard from an astronaut. I've heard from a scientist. I've heard from some curator here. For them, it was kind of like a, like a game. They would say, oh, this is fun. If it were just a little tiny sign with no little teeth question, I don't think anything would have done. Well, it, it's, I don't know what I'm going to get. Why do I want to make the effort, a 10-second effort to do that? Okay. So fun and easy. If it's too difficult, people won't do it. The effort must be greater than a less than the reward. Okay, so Michael, to your point, what's an example of a game? So take out your phone and go to text messaging and send a text. 56512 is the phone number. And put in NASM space game. NASM space game. First one that gets the answer gets a reply. Read it out. Who got a reply? Okay, Mark, what does it say? To begin with line maximum A dot. Include maximum space and answer 
Alright, so, uh, for all of you, since you're now in it, all you've got to do is put A in your message and hit send. So just A and send. Mark, did you get the next question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. How many plants can you see in the sky with your naked eyes? Three, four, five, or six? So reply NASM. Did you have to say that reply NASM thing? It threw me off the first you, time I realized you, I'm already talking to NASM. I wouldn't have known if you hadn't said just today. Yeah, I, I need to talk about that. Are we all saying? Did y'all get somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, I, just, I, just, I stopped. Okay. Okay. Joe, did you get it? So you can tell because no one's looking at me, you're all more interested in this little game. And it's a silly little it's not a thing, right? It took me, I don't know, 20 minutes to create this little game. But it's so unusual for a museum to create a little experience like this. It's fun and educational. I'm going to look for other examples like that. So the point here is. The bar is pretty low. The interesting thing is inconsistency is just in that one question. It asks you how many, and it spells out the number. Yeah. If you put in a digit, it says, I don't understand you. Then you put, you type in the number, it gives you the answer, and the answer is they use a digit. Yes. So and that's just because when they when they typed it out, they, they didn't think about those things. Okay. <laughs> back row, you're cheating. So that's the point. So, Michael, to your question, what's an example of a game? You might say, this is not a game. This is just like a silly little trivia thing. But the replies, many of our institutions will at the very end say, text me back what you thought of this. This was awesome. I had so much fun with my kids and said that. Way over the top for what one would think. So that's sort of the, uh, what I'm. What I'm because I know how much data you have after doing this for so long. And yeah. you can really say, you can compare this family of projects with this family of projects. Right. Is it, I'm going to restate, it's actually, I'm going to restate what I thought I heard from you to make sure I read. That, that these simpler approaches have a dramatically higher use, utilization, take up rate, get more complicated than Ten times. It, it, yeah. It's so Nine far off the charts. The more complicated it is, or the longer, the okay. so drop off okay. rate is just remarkable. Another article to send is it's called um, Your Website Makes Me Fat. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's, it's about that you can't ask your users. To, every time you ask the user to figure out something, it's exhausting the same mental capacities they use to decide to do things. They're the same thing. Yes. So the first thing you'd want to do is decide what are my goals. Am I trying to kill some time? Am I trying to educate the visitor? Does development want me to do this because I want to get donation from them? Or does marketing want me to do this because they're going to get an email address? Or is it just pure fun and education? So once you've decided what that is, then what museums are doing, they're building interactions that take you on a little journey to do that. So for example, the Smithsonian uh, Zoo did a little experiment a couple years ago with mobile giving. And they had a big sign up next to the frog exhibit that said, text frog to donate 10 dollars. Nobody did. Oh, I, I don't know much about fraud. Why would I donate it? Where's the money going? All those kinds of things. So then they got some game developer or game developer contact with them. It was a very popular game that had to do with fraud at the time. And he had a splash screen that said, I know you're at the Smithsonian. Would you please text? It, it's very important to save the fraud. Text the word fraud. Well, they made only because somebody told them to do that in a kind of contextual. Without that, they wouldn't have played that game. So they played a little, they played a little uh, game, and the benefit then was, thank you for letting me play the game, and I'll do it. So it's, it's, it's almost like a, a 
starts to load in advertising for those schools. That's, that's right. And I've got an example with the Credit Art Museum. So. More questions? Loading a lot of people will have speeds, especially at live events, where while I'm drinking, I'm having my cocktail, and I'm talking to all my buddies, there are screens up, and I can text in, and my answers will show up instantly. And what these ants are doing is they're having fun ones. This is all their memories. And then the next one would be something about the Dallas family. What is the membership cost? How many parties do we have here? So they'll blend in some education with some fun. So by the end of the evening, I'm not doing this just, you know, I'm not standing and doing this. I'm just doing this because it's a conversation. OK, so game life. So if you can institute some really light game-like things, we can convey some knowledge. This is to your point, why would I want to do that? Maybe it's because I want to make it social and interactive. Uh, some museums will use games, scavenger to take people to places in the museum that no one's going to. Either for crowd control, or there's some really cool stuff in the third floor that nobody's seen. So they'll have on the main area, want to play a scavenger hunt, text in the word hunt, and they'll say, go to the third floor, look at the display case that has this, and text in the word whatever. Learn a little bit about it, and then they'll take you on another part of it. It's great press. People will talk about these little, tiny little interactions on Yelp or TripAdvisor, absolutely. And then, to my point earlier, it can lead then to membership or donation or whatever it is you're, you're really trying to do. OK, so we'll talk about uh, Colonial Williamsburg. They, you all know something about Colonial Williamsburg. Um, so they have a game that was created by John McAvee, same fellow that worked with the Theon and the Ghost of the team and the Ghost of and it's called Red Crest. And when you go to the museum, they, I was just going to ask me, they say, do you want to play a game where you could be a spy for the Americans and they were the colonists, I should say, and um, to try to figure out who are the British, British agents. And if you say yes, you get a scarf. You can wear the scarf, which I do on that one. And you get a packet of information that's been sealed. And in this packet, it tells you what to do to start. And it will say, before you begin, send the word spy to 56512 via your special messaging device. So let's play the game. So um, on your text, reply with the word end, because I gotta, I've got to get you out of that other little tour you were in. So first, reply end, E-N-D, and you'll get back, thank you for texting end, then you'll be out of that one. And then you reply spy. Tell me what you get once you get the spot. Read it. You're now in communication with this lady of secret correspondence. Okay. So you look in your schedule, and it will tell you what to do next. And it will tell you a little bit about this thing. And of course, this is where the game can be a little complicated because it's, an, it's intentionally an immersive experience. So there's two kinds of games. One that is totally immersive, like the Gold of the Chance, or one or, or something like this. It says now, now contact our London agent. Send the word Lee to 56512 to alert our friend to your presence. So go ahead and reply with the word Lee. L-E-E. -E. Be warned, your messages must cross the Atlantic. So use our special cycle. I am Arthur Lee, one of my agents. And Mary Johnson was the alias that was actually used. All, all of this is based on historical stuff. So I was there, 
last week. I'm telling you, it was a rainy day. There were 50 families gathered around. Like, oh my God, where's the Mary Johnson house? Where's this? And they're just tearing around. And their first clue was to go to this house. And you go behind this house, and there are these pieces of paper with these words on them. And there was a nine-year-old girl, um, a nine-year-old girl standing there. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm deciphering the code. I'm thinking, for good for you, show me how to do it. So she looked in her little book. And there is a way to decipher that code. Now, you might say this contradicts what I'm saying about make it easy, but if you're in it and it's fantastic, you're going you're gonna to keep going. Nobody, you know, you wanted to see what this meant. So these words gave you clues as to what to do next. And they wove a little story in to try to find out who are the spots. And you can only trust people that have the purple um, scarf on. So, in terms of something fun, Williamsburg, I think, has nailed it. What's it called? Rev Quest Save the Revolution. And there's a great video online, if you want to look at it, that they've got at Rev Quest. And here's the little girl. This is last year's. So you see all these people all throughout Williamsburg who are doing this. And when you talk to folks in Williamsburg, you see. I said, well, why are you doing this? First of all, it brings families together, and it brings strangers together. Because when I did it, I could not figure out some of these clues. So these two ladies and I were trying to decipher these clues. We kept looking for a nine-year-old to help us. <laughs> there weren't any at the time. So it, it brings people together, and it becomes very much of a quest. And John McAvee would say, that's what you want. And we call it a quest. All right, that's good. So they've got 800,000 in tech. I don't know what percent of visitors are playing, but it's a huge number of visitors playing. It's on Yelp, it's on social media. People are talking about you got to do the Red Quest game, it's got to be a spy game. And they're finding out that people are really learning a lot about history and what it was like to be um, somebody there when you played this game. OK, we talked about a short attention span. Do not think your folks are basically going to get through a tour. Downloadable apps, much more than the normal person wants, unless it's really special. A mobile website is not a very effective guide for the exhibit. It's too hard. It's not contextual. It's too hard to navigate where am I, et cetera. When GPS comes, we'll all be able to walk around and know that I'm right here, then it's going to be great. So it's not going to be contextual. All right, so let's reply and and then do sculpture space 10. And tell me what you've got. And it's got to be cheap. Who gets it? Anybody get it so far? Yeah, so check that group. Okay, so click that link. And you're standing in front of this. Sculpture and studio in San Francisco. And yeah. Yeah, that's on um, that Hirsch one. Yeah. Oh, it was. It's not there anymore. Yeah, it's that's a picture yeah. from the yeah. picture from yeah. Hirsch on this right here. So, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a green <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this was outside, and now it's in San Francisco. So there's a sign right next to it that gives the visitor four choices, and that's kind of the holy grail of mobile contextual, easy interactions is what they've done. If I don't want to use my smartphone and I'm kind of old-fashioned, I can just dial and hear Mark talk. 
If I don't really know about barcodes, which most people don't, I can't scan that or I can text scan. QR codes, for the most part, are great to have on signs, but no one is using them. It's something like uh, half of 1%. If, if 100 people came by, about 10% are, are doing something, and about a half of 1% are scanning a QR code. The most popular things are dialing a number and sending a text in, because that text brings me, as they did on your phone, right to the page that I'm looking at. And that's as much information as I want. Have you seen big changes in uh, consumers' willingness, visitors' willingness to send text messages? Unbelievable. Yeah, go ahead and talk about that. It, was, it started to not become an issue about a year ago. Now it is just not an issue whatsoever, except with international visitors. And that's why, as that MoMA said, well, then here's the URL. If you want the if, if you want to do it on your phone, you can do it on your phone. If you don't, if you don't want to text, the texting is becoming uh, the way to get contextual information. Even if you go to Starbucks now, instead of going to the Starbucks, instead of if you want the Starbucks app, they'll have you text it with Starbucks instead of making you go to the app store and looking and typing. It's just easier. Just texting with Starbucks. Same thing with museums. If you want people to get information. Give them a short code and a keyword that brings them right to that place. Questions? So clever marketing. So you mentioned what is it we're trying to accomplish. So you've got to first decide what am I, what am I trying to do? Is it an education thing? I want people to sign up or buy something. But then I'll work on my plan to get them to do that. The other thing that we really learned is being indirect works 10 times greater than coming right out and saying, do this. If you want to uh, raise money, you don't say, text in the word ABC to give us money. You can play a little game, have them answer some questions, do a little something, circumvent it, make it kind of indirect, and you'll have much more success. Instead of saying, um, Want to learn the highlights of our museum? I don't know. How about play a little scavenger hunt which takes you around our museum? So be indirect. And I've got an example of you here. Okay, so the Monterey Bay Aquarium, what they say out front is text in to sign for text message words for special things during your visit. And they get a lot of people through the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and a lot of people will text in. But the real goals are crowd control because so many people get kind of stuck in one area. And I'm moving visitors to areas that do not get much visitation. And at the end of the day, they want to cut people in one of So marketing, in some sense, is driving this whole thing. So we will text in, and I'll show you that. So reply end, and then text in feeding. And then feeding. Tell me what you get. Thanks for signing up. We have some text for the visit to link you to the school. Okay. But that's not all we're going to send to you. We're going to send you all maybe four or five pre scheduled during your visit. And the response to this is fantastic. All of a sudden, I'll get a text and I say, 11.45 in five minutes. A curator is going to appear over here, show up. All of a sudden, I've been doing this happens. All of a sudden, you know, 25 people looking at the jellyfish thing just get up and walk over here. It's almost like a, a special kind of a privilege thing. And then at the end of the day, and you folks are all on, when we get done with this, if you don't want to receive them today, it's actually kind of fun. You can reply stop and go to the author. So um, Monterey uses an indirect way to get people to do things. And then cross department. So we found many more departments now are starting to work together. Instead of it just being an education thing, it's education and development or education and marketing. And an example is uh, San Diego State University, their big issue is 
when, when kids graduate, they change their email addresses, and we have no way to contact them. So they only have email addresses for 10, 20% of all their alumni. But the one thing you never change in life is your cell phone number. Cell phone number. <laughs> so they are creating a whole text message thing around commencement. So they sent out 8,000 emails to 8,000 friends. In one day, 50% replied, yes, at me. They sent one more. They're up to something like 6,000 out of 8,000. They're kind of interested in the whole commencement stuff, but that's not why they're doing it. Marketing, alumni relations, are then at the end of commencement, going to send them a text, you know, in June, saying, hope graduation was a blast. Hope you enjoyed getting all these text messages with links on the website. And by the way, if you don't reply, stop. We'll send you some really cool text over the summer about what's happening on campus. They'll figure out the thing. So they now have 6,000 cell phone numbers that they can connect with. So they use the commencement thing as a way to get um, phone numbers. Uh, Fred Art Museum down in Miami, they have an exhibit uh, on the Caribbean that is starting, and they're trying to figure out how do I drive people in the, in the uh, community to come. So what they said was, marketing and education went together, They've got 250 locations. They're going to put their own tabletop signs, barber shops, and restaurants. And you can play this game too. So go ahead and reply end, and then do cruise. And you'll enter the. And you'll see they've done a really clever thing here. Tell me after you text cruise what you get. Ooh, it's your email address. That's what they want. They want your email address so they can get you in their email plan and then send you emails about not only the Caribbean activity, but other things. So instead of a sign that says text in your email, text in your email address, you're entering a contest with a cruise. And if you did text in your email address, um, what they then will send you is an option to opt in for text message alerts and all kinds of different things. And they're getting a pretty high response rate. So they took it on an indirect basis, and they worked with two different departments. And the individual sitting out in the community said, oh, this is pretty cool. And they were going to the Fred Art Museum. Then they'll be on your email address, on the email, on the email list, and they'll start to set them up. And then an iPad, um, we're starting to see iPads uh, take the place of more uh, permanent um, displays, and the sites have one that's showing all over the country for marching bands and mascots, and it's all touch pads, and all the data and statistics are all captured, because even though it's an iPad, it's being transmitted back to the cloud, back to the wire system. So that's just another little little trend that we're seeing. OK, we got done in 40 minutes. How about questions? Arguments, disagreements, all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Is it the high to five and two? Yeah. It's the, it's the sign of, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and and then E I N O. I forgot to even this course. Eight years ago. Five questions for this. You capture your. So just a little demo will be there. And this then goes to our mobile web platform where you can put the quiz on your Okay, Michael, you think about this stuff all the time. What are your questions so or observations? I'm wondering that the way you guys need to go out with the I want to drop you off here. This is good. So the three, three things, easiest, most solid tech roll at it I've ever taken part in 24 years ago from technology. Mm -hmm. It just was rock solid. It was as easy as it was now. All of the technology was abstracted for me. I wrote, you know, we wrote a check and it worked and it never went down. And it's amazing the way that this was. 
and they could still get sort of the core strength of it. And, and, and it was so far ahead. We were people who were using flip phones, who were using feature phones back then to do it. And the world, you know, Moore's Law, and the world was kind of caught up with it. Right. And I'm, I'm amazed and excited to hear how, how dependable uh, it must have been. Yeah. Texting, yeah. especially with the link, the little bit link, well, to a mobile web page, now that 70% of us have had a smartphone, you can bring them to that page, ask them to fill out a form, ask them to go to watch a video, ask them to go to uh, the, the home page, whatever you want. But you, you use clever tactics to get them engaged. You just don't say, here it is. Do all of them want to can I use this somehow to, do, to distribute something that's already being very successful? I'm using two things. One, we have a leaf stock, as well as we have a And right now, the way the technology is for those apps, you can download and do all that stuff. But there's no email capture. Right. Could I do it somehow through that text this? Yeah, play, the, the, play a little. You know, see how much you know about whatever. It's like a, like a rev quest put down to like your, your dino game. And at the end, it will say, and click this link to go to the store to download the game. You don't know how many people click the link because you're captured. I thought it would be fun and simple. It's more just thinking instead of throwing a free to do that. Or you just do it on your phone. Do it on the phone. Yeah, it's it's probably not going to have yeah. the same functionality, but it might be fine for the visitor. The other thing that I've been thinking about the impact is. The, because from a from our perspective, it's so easy to change the content, and the metrics are right there. The metrics are real time. It's really you, you never get the messaging right the first time. Um, so it, it yields to this kind of approach of continuous improvement yeah. that we really need to see from these examples that the messaging can really affect the outcomes. And that's I think we don't get to work in an environment like that. Certainly, no web platforms have that. initially be engaged, but if you could play a game about that, hear from somebody that has worked on it, or hear from the son of the daughter, there's 10, ten things for, for link back to a really great website that the Smithsonian has. People, people will get sucked in to this because I am dealing with the Smithsonian. I'm making an effort to, to walk around, and I'm like, I'm not objecting to learning. Just that the spoon sound is made of the sugar food. Should have at least one or five ways to learn more because I'm in Spain. I don't want to rent a, a guide, and if I do, it's only one percent of collection. The museum has all this stuff. Make it easy for me. And that's why I'm so passionate. And I see institutions that do make it easy. Their numbers are just unbelievably high. That's why you're there. So that is or examples that you can give to continue your experiences with the Lincoln data. 
very few of them do that. And I think it goes back to the I was the visit I was the guest of the person that went, or I'm not that interested in the uh, I, uh, I think the problem is the call to action. So there's no most these very few museums are organized around a clear compelling call to action. I bet but again like of all the museums if it's in so many years could make because you're you know, you're about climate, you're about you see these uh, that's environmental right. impact. There's an issue there that I can get excited about. That's probably um, right. And and I think you know I think your whole strategic plan can be some of the ones ongoing call action. So it's not just about the visit to Next to the curious is set up for that, but I'm not always going to put the kids that have colors and they're gonna go but you know yeah. after their experience of curious mm -hmm. and record the field work. Then you get to another level. Yeah. Sure, you want to give out briefings, but I just actually it's this one to another level. Yeah. 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 Then we can put just to try to try that at some level. Just test it. Thank you. 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 Thank the the, um, well, then it could be just as simple. You do something, and then if you end up on front, you get a check that says, if you'd like to be on a really cool insider email list, reply with your email. You don't know in one week what percent of people participated and what percent of people are replying. Do you have a story? Tell us. Do you have a story about? <laughs> A, so, I mean, another thing I love about this platform is just so easy to prototype. Yeah. Um, of kind of a lot of scenario at an institution turning into something that's good. Um, Central Park's a good one. Central Park started by Central Park Conservancy. Um, it's a group that manages Central Park, but nobody knows that it's a foundation that. When the trees all fall down in a state storm, they're the one that has to climb it. So they decided, let's make, uh, let's put some audio stops all around. So they did that, but it was it was just, a, you know, here's this and here's this. Then they said, let's get celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> so they got Yoko Ono to do Strawberry Fields. They got Bloomberg. They got all these. They got Whoopi. They got all these people. Seinfeld to talk about their favorite spot. Then they changed the sign instead of. All this number is, you know, all this number is what to do. It would say, here, Whoopi, talk about the. All of a sudden, it went through the roof. Then they said, okay, now that's great. What would we really want? We want to extend the experience. So at the very end, you get a text that says, reply with your email to be on a hidden, super secret list. Oh my gosh. When I run reports to the email, they get hundreds of thousands of thousands of emails. So that's one that they didn't really know what they were going to do in the beginning. But they just kind of changed, kept changing, looking at the staff, and hmm, not many people are doing it. So this kid looked over Mookie and Seinfeld, and Mark Bloomberg to talk. We just filmed it, and then all of a sudden, the sign then had to say that, because if you don't tell people, they're, you know, that you can hear from the son of the pilot. I mean, who's interested really in this painting? I keep pointing this up. But nobody here is that interested. But if the sign says, hear from, Michael Smith, the grandson or the son of the uh, pilot, you're going to dial it. Yeah. It'll be hard not to because it's just so tempting. Yeah. You talked about signing. You try to coordinate signing within our museums. Not as flexible as I would look at it. Uh, could, could you, and our dozens of volunteers are out there you know, on the front lines. Is it, can you tell us a story of success just by the word, <laughs> word of mouth? Well, you know, in the sense, like, back to your point about. Uh, behind the scenes, you know, the, the, the person starts saying, hey, you can text this. You know, it could be a behind the scenes knowledge of something. So, you yesterday I go to the Boulder Shakespeare Library there when I go home. I walk in, the man greets me, and the first thing he says is, which is what, what I was hoping he was going to say. Because I was like, and I said, I do. And he said, unbelievable behind the scenes tour. There's a little sign, little tiny sign, 
Let me show you what they look like. They're kind of hidden, so you'll have to look for it. But if you dial that number, you'll get some more clear. I just thought, good for him. So they have small, but because that man told me about this, and it made me, ooh, I could do this. Fine. And I'm almost like looking for, now I'm looking for the signs. And once you dial in and you hear, they have really good content when you hear this person up. I learned a lot. This display case doesn't have anything. I have no idea what's about to chase their folio. I talked to a couple of them. And we're on 301, so should we break? Um, I, I don't see people coming, okay. so we, if other, you have any other questions. questions. International. Do you have international platform? Do you have a platform that part our partners can use in other parts of the world? Um, probably 10% of our clients are overseas. And what they're doing is they're using QR codes, which are much more accepted and popular than they are here. Or in certain countries, they're texting in. In the UK, they're texting in. In Germany, they're texting in. Because we to the local. To the local. And so we, we just have to work with that. Okay. But people love texting. You know, you text and you get a link, you click the link, and you see it. Um, and has the has the environment for international learning changed at all in the last few years? Last time I checked in, it was still like you hear a Scotsman will never open his or her plenum. Yeah, it's still pretty. London. It's still pretty bad, and museums are doing a little better, but not great. I thought was it, was it the Smithsonian that had a big sign that said we're Wi-Fi friendly or something? It's spotty. Yeah. Some do, some don't. So if it's promoted. And that could be on the sign, it would say, uh, or scan the QR code, Wi-Fi code is such and such. But so many museums either don't provide that or promote that, and then the uh, international visitors can do that. And it's still really expensive. Okay. I'll take two. <laughs> We're out. Sorry. No. Uh, Joe took talk, the talk last one. Thanks, everybody. Is there oh, material sorry. over there? I do another question. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, there was this question of um, people being busy and how many people will, will do anything, make it simple so more people do it. Which always makes it sound like the goal is we need 90% of the people to come through, come through the door to do this other thing. And the reality is we would just like 90% of the people to come through the door to go through the museum and learn something, my reality, and the 10% who've already been here 50 times and want some other experience, that's who I should be trying to reach with this thing. And therefore I shouldn't be reaching them with, let me ask you five questions. I should be reaching with, you've seen these exhibits before, now let me give you another perspective on it, let me give you the other 12 objects related to that object, and if the goal should not be, and the expectation shouldn't be, i got to reach 80% of the people to come through the door with this. It's, no, I want to have my people who are already really engaged with the museum get something more out of their visit. I think it's two. I think that's one, but the other goal would be I want to create more people to fit in that bucket. And if I can get them to use their phone to do something, it's like I'm invested. Like why a lot of our clients do this mobile giving where you can donate five bucks on your phone. I tell people you're not going to make that much money, but you're going to get a lot of people who have never donated before, and they're going to feel very different because they spent five bucks. They almost feel more committed to that organization. So I think it's two things, Mark. I think the other part is if you can get me to play a little game about this or a little tiny something, I can get a little. Like I got something pretty cool out of that, that experience, even though people in this room know that this stuff's been around for a long time, and it's not its not that cool, but for the visitor who's never done it, I had a pretty good experience. And we know that because people will leave comments either by texting or by pressing zero. And what I've done is I've gone back and seen how many things you looked at before you made this unbelievable, raving, positive comment. That's two. So it, it, it wasn't this, I spent an hour doing this. I listened to one or two things, but that was really, to me, that is something that I'm going to listen to and remember. So I think you've got two different groups. Then on the group that you want to get um, re-engaged, 
That could be some special tour, like take a, take a tour of things that you've never seen before, like a Star Wars tour of, of, um, of uh, aerospace museum or something like that. And I should also mention, I wish I knew what the video was, but years ago, the director of the uh, art museum in Baltimore's uh, Watchers. Watchers. I think it's talking about these things, about audio tour, and the same thing is to charge fewer files for the audio tour, and 10% of the people or less would take the audio tour, but those people rated everything in the museum uh, a full point or a full star higher, including the restaurants, than anybody else. So it had nothing to do with the audio tour, but everything about the experience is better because they had an audio tour. So they changed the rules. They said admission is twelve dollars if you take the audio tour. Admission is ten dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and they said it was actually more important than to have those positive responses. I they love that. They to get more donations by being able to say this is how much people love us. They made more money. In he actually said they lose money because of what it costs to run the building. Yeah, visitors cost them money, so it's important. Isn't it was that more, I don't. Know, this is like fifteen yeah. years ago. Yeah. 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 if you can track that with institutions. Well, I'm pretty sure it was the Walters group that okay. I was talking about. But that would be, it was a long time. I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously biased. If I started the company because I wanted to have a better experience when I go to the museum. If I'm at a museum, I'm not a room. That's my bias. So I am, I really am biased. But I just can keep the statistics and read that news. People that do something, and it doesn't have to be much, seem to have a better experience because they leave these comments. Whoa, really awesome. Just listen to two audio files. You just play a little five, five question game. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. <laughs>